Would you join me if you have your Bibles in Matthew chapter 16, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. I don't know if I'm the only one like this, but, you know, I'll buy something from a Home Depot or Lowe's and it may be a grill or maybe an entertainment center, but it comes, or Ikea, even worse, it comes in a box, right? Are you with me? And in that box, there will be, a, 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 you know, some sheets of paper, eight and a half by 11, that are stapled together, or perhaps it's even a booklet. And the, there are instructions on assembly. And they come in different languages, and you have English and sometimes Spanish. And I think those are really, really, really helpful for those who need them. <clears throat> but I was pretty confident I didn't ever need the instructions. And so several things would happen. I would get into I'd have all the parts laid out on the floor. My wife wanted a, a greenhouse. And so I, I said, great, I'll get you a greenhouse. Didn't realize it comes in like a thousand parts. And so you're trying to piece it all together. And, and so I don't know how many times I've got to half put together and realized I have to take it apart because I went out of sequence. And this part needed to go in before this part. Almost every time I finish a project, I have parts left over. <laughs> and then there are times where you just, I've, I've broken parts because I've tried to fit them in where they didn't belong. Is anybody else like me and are willing to admit it this morning? Um, when it comes to the church, it's really nice, it's great to go back to find out what was the plan for it all? What were the instructions? And Jesus is going to give us those in Matthew chapter 6, or six excuse me, Matthew chapter 16. In just a little bit of the context, uh, this, Jesus was on his way, he should have a map here, but he was on his way uh, down to Jerusalem to die. And so the events preceding Matthew chapter 16, he's on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And then rather than going south, uh, continuing his journey to Jerusalem, he goes out of his way 30 miles. And this is before there was mass transit, before there were cars or Uber or anything like that. So he's going out of his way 30 miles to teach his disciples something that was so important that the place had to be significant. It's a, the, the, the little town called Caesarea Philippi. It's a location. And if I could take you there this morning, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's north and east of, Ces or of, of uh, the Sea of Galilee. And the, the waters, the snow from Mount Hermon melts and comes down to the rivers and tributaries. And this time of the year is forming these little raging rivers. It's coming down. And this place is like a, a beautiful, what do you call it? Almost a Garden of Eden. Absolutely beautiful. It's a place where uh, it's green, there's forestry there. But it's also a place It was known for its pagan worship, a center for pagan worship. There's a large cliff, and on the face of the cliff, there are carved out spots where gods were placed in those little niches, and people would come to worship their gods. There was a spot where a, 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 a shrine was built to the Caesar, where people would worship emperor, emperor worship at that time. And it was also known, not only as a spot for pagan worship, it was a, a known for, a, as a spot for sinful living. In other words, if you were living in that time and you visited Caesarea Philippi, it might be said, uh, what happens in Caesarea Philippi stays in Caesarea Philippi, if you know what I mean. This was a, a sinful spot. It was a spot for pagan worship of multiple gods. And Jesus took his disciples 30 miles out of the way to this spot to ask them one question. Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're, you're one of the prophets of the Old Testament or you come like them. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? This is the most important question that every person that's ever born has to answer. Who do you say that I am? And you can be wrong about a lot of things, but you can't be wrong on this. Because this answer determines eternity. And Peter responds by saying, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. None of these other gods can compare. In fact, we're not adding you to the list. You are the list. You are the son of God. 
That was critical because Jesus would be the one who would define their lives in terms of their sole purpose, their sole love, and all of these, the pleasures of the world or the gods of the world couldn't satisfy the needs of the human heart like Jesus could. And then Jesus would, would mention two things in chapter 16, both for the first time. He mentioned the cross. I must go to the cross. And remember Peter's response was like, what are you talking about? Let it never be so. And then he mentions a second thing for the first time. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. On that landscape where you would see the... Uh, the, the niches for different gods, there's a big cavern that would go down into the, the end of the earth. That was known by people at that time as the gates of hell. The gates of hell in ancient Near, Near Eastern culture was just a, a, a term that was used to refer to the devil, Satan, and his cohorts. And it's believed that at that time, in the, the gates of hell was the winter ab abode for Baal, the god Baal, and he would come out in the spring, and he was God of the harvest, and that, that kind of thing, and he would exercise his authority. And Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So I want to share with you pretty quickly this morning five principles from that verse that are going to be so helpful to keep in mind as God continues to lead Bible Baptist Church in the days ahead. Are you with me yet? Okay. Number one, Jesus will build his church. Jesus will build his church. The, the, the emphasis is future. I will build my church. He mentions it for the first time, but the church is not an afterthought. He had this design before the beginning of time. He had this in mind. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He will build it. He's the builder. We read as, as well in Ephesians 2. Uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3.11. No one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 19-22 say the same thing, that Jesus is the cornerstone, he's the headstone, he is the church. And we must build our church on that. He's the builder of the church, and he's going to use people like us to build the church. Ephesians 4 will give you some more detail on that in terms of the purpose of the church, uh, worship, fellowship, evangelism, and discipleship. He'll build the church. He's the builder. That's fascinating to note because in, in, in the landscape of churches in the United States and even around the world, Oftentimes, there may be a charismatic person, a man or a woman, who's built a huge ministry. And they'll talk about, I've built this church, or this is my church. And how foolish that is. This isn't, the church is not built by, by any man or by any woman. We can't do it. We can share the gospel. We can't save people. Only Jesus does that. And the church is a body of believers. Um, so Jesus will build his church. Everybody agree with that? Yeah, it's, it, he's the builder. But he's also the owner of the church. You say, is there a difference? There's a nuance, a big nuance of difference. He is the owner of the church. He said, I will build my church. Jesus gave himself up for the church. Jesus purchased the church with his blood. We read in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of uh, which is of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds over the flock of God, which he has purchased with his blood. This is Jesus' church. He's the owner of it. Amen. So many times over the years, uh, I've, I was asked by people outside of Woodside, they would say, well, uh, who runs the church? Who runs the church? And I, I would say, well, that would be Jesus. No, 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 no. Who's, who makes the decisions? And, and I know where they were going. The, the correct answer to them was either the pastor or the elders or the deacons or the oldest members or the, 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 the financial deep pockets. Who runs it? And so when they press, I would say, Jesus. This is his church. I don't know if anybody would disagree with that theologically. But I know a lot of people who, who don't embrace that and practically believe it. 
because they have their own agendas. They want their things. And this is why we have things like worship wars in churches. We have people leaving churches because they didn't like the, the, uh, the, the color of the carpet or whatever. I remember a, a man called me once and he said, you know, um, my wife and I are going to be leaving the church. I said, well, can we talk about it? So we had breakfast together and I said, well, what's the problem? We'd gone through life with him. Uh, he had had a heart attack in one of our services. I mean, we were, we were there for his family. And he said, well, you, you, you removed the traditional service from 11 o'clock to 8.30. And that's just too early for us. I said, really? I said, what time do you start work? He said, well, I'm at work early. But, but Sunday, you sleep in, right? Yeah. I said, what would be a, a legitimate start time for you and your wife for, for a service? He said, well, probably 9 o'clock. So I said, for a half hour. I didn't say it quite like this. There was, I wasn't going to win this argument. I said, for a half hour, you're going to give up all that we have in terms of our relationship. And I thought, ouch. This is Jesus, church. And it's his agenda. And all of our agendas are subservient to what he wants to do. All of our, uh, our action plans, our response and obedience to what he's commanded for the church, whether it's to give or whether it's to be a part of the church or whether it's to share the gospel, we do all of that because he told us to. This is his church. And I've heard, heard this a lot over the last few years. Well, I love Jesus but I don't love the church so much. So what church do you go to? I don't go to any church. But you love Jesus. Yeah, I love Jesus. May I suggest to you this morning, you cannot legitimately say you love Jesus if you don't love what he loved. Does that make sense? We can't say we love Jesus if we don't love what he loved. Did Jesus love the church? Enough to die for it. You say, well, the church isn't perfect. There won't be one. The Bible talks, talks about the fact that one day the church, the bride, will be presented to the bridegroom as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. But until then, we're an imperfect church, continuing to grow to be more like Jesus Christ, continuing to be obedient to all that he wants us to be. But we're imperfect until that day. So let's embrace that and encourage each other in, in the Lord and, and spur one another on to love and to good works. So whose church is it, folks? Jesus. Jesus Church. The third thing I wanted to share with you this morning, and that is the church is made up of people who are committed to Christ. I remember doing a youth retreat in Ontario many years ago. And there was a, a young man who came to the retreat. He was a senior in high school. And at some point in the retreat, he said to me, he said, this is so cool. I want to be a part of it. I love these kids. And I said, do you have what they have? He said, what do you mean? I said, they are the way they are because they have Jesus. And he wanted to be a part of it. And he eventually came to know Jesus as Savior. The church is made up of people. I've heard some of your stories of God wondrously interrupted your life. And you, you were convinced that you were a sinner in need of a savior and God saved you powerfully. And you came to become part of this church. The word church or ecclesia is used about 115 times in the New Testament. Um, about 92, time, uh, uh, 92 of those occurrences, he's referring to a local church. A few times, once he's just referring to an assembly. Um, but a few times is referring to that universal body of believers, sometimes called the universal church or the family of God. And when a person comes to know Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, they immediately are baptized into the body of Christ. That baptism, they didn't, they were, were, the only effect of that 
is that you were placed into. You are placed into, immersed into the body of Christ. And you became part of that with, with people, Christians from Korea and Japan and South America and Venezuela, all of these people who are part of the family of God. So if you're sitting some, next to somebody in the airplane and you, you find out that they're a believer, immediately you have some affinity with them. And you can talk because while you may have a lot of differences, including language, you have the most important component in common, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the responsibility then, as we become part of this church through salvation, is to gather together for, for worship, and then it's to be scattered for evangelism. So we must be strategic in working with Jesus to help build his church by sharing the gospel with others. That's what he's commanded us to do. So we do that. Uh, a, a man wrote a book years ago, and he said, if we're, if we're ever going to reach today's generation, we have to build bridges of love strong enough to carry the weight of the gospel. There are lots of people today who want to build bridges of love, but they don't want to include the gospel. And I think that's cruel. To, to do good things in the name of a church, but without ever sharing the good news of the gospel is, is almost cruel because we're not preparing people beyond this life for the next. Number four, the church must be on the offensive. The Bible says here, this verse, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You've heard it said before, the gates are not an offensive weapon, they're a defensive weapon. In other words, the, a city would look to its walls. Um, and if a city had no walls, it had no glory. The, the glory of a city were its walls. Um, so if a city had no walls, it was considered insignificant. So a city like a city of Nineveh had walls, and those walls were so thick that three chariots could ride abreast on the, on the top of that city wall. But there were openings in that wall where there were gates, and those gates would be closed. Solomon had that in his day, they called the Solomonic gates, where you had to weave around so that a, a, a battering ram couldn't go straight through that. It was defensive. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. With the assumption then is that the church of Jesus Christ will be on the offensive. And I put down four or five different ways that could happen. The church must be bold and aggressive. How? With its holy living. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children, children of God without fault in a wicked and depraved generation. And we're to shine as stars in this perverse generation. And so we must be holy in our living. As we sang this morning, we need to be holy as he is holy. Uh, secondly, with intentional gospel communication. Jesus said uh, some of his la last words in Acts chapter 1 before he ascended into heaven, and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and of the ends of the earth. I love the wording there. He's not inviting him to do it. He's telling him you are going to be doing it. And so we are witnesses for Jesus Christ. We're either good or bad or intentional or uh, pathetic witnesses for Jesus Christ. We want to be intentional and bold in our gospel presentation. And then thirdly, a church must be bold and aggressive with good deeds. There's a verse in Scripture, uh, just a, a verse in passing in the book of Acts in one of the sermons, and it says, And Jesus went about doing good. I, I read a lot into that verse. I think it's such a cool verse. And Jesus went about doing good. We have record of some of that, but not nearly all of what he did. When he saw lepers, his heart was broken, and he wanted to heal lepers. Um, when he saw a, a woman who was caught in adultery, uh, and she was about ready to be stoned, and Jesus reached out to her. He was constantly doing good deeds. The, and it was, it was part of who he was. There's a word that's used in, in the original language with, with, regarding Jesus. He says he was moved with compassion. The word there is splanknitsomai. And it means a, a passion that comes from deep within. 
In the King James Version, they'll often use uh, his, the, the word reins uh, or kidneys. That he was, they, they believed that the, uh, the emotions came from deep within one's stomach or his belly. But Jesus uses the word splanknitzomai to me. He was moved with compassion. It was in him, and it had to come out. We need to be people of compassion with good deeds. I remember I shared this story in the earlier service today. Um, I'm just looking at this countdown down here, Pastor Tim. It says zero. Does that mean I'm done or I'm just getting started? <laughs> um, seriously. Okay. Thank you. You heard the old story about what does it mean when the pastor looks at his watch? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Um, several years ago, we were looking at hiring somebody to run our children's program at church. And we were interviewing a guy, and I had the last interview in, with him. And he, he, I, I said, what do you do for your hobbies? And he said, I, I go to Thailand. It wasn't what I expected. I was expecting I read novels or I golf or I skydive. He said, I go to Thailand. I said, what do you do in Thailand? And he began to share with me the story of the human trafficking tragedy of Thailand. And how little children are ripped away from their families or in some cases have no parents. And they find their way to the streets of Bangkok to be used and abused. And I said, what do you do in Thailand? He said, there's a warehouse there. And I can, he said, I go to that warehouse and it's an auction for children. And he said, I can buy a little girl for $300. And if they knew what I was doing, they would kill me on the spot. And they would take, I would take her out, we'd get in a taxi, and I'd go high into the mountains and leave her at an orphanage. And he said, I've done that 110 times. I said, wow. We never ended up hiring Daryl. Um, he went on to become the... Uh, executive director of the Children's Pastors Conference, a national organization. But I, I, that, I couldn't get that out of my mind. So in weeks later in a message, I just, unplanned, I just said, so it's like those, the human trafficking going on in Thailand and shared a little bit about it. And people came up to me afterwards and said, well, like, what are we going to do about it? I wasn't prepared for that. But I love the question, what are we going to do about it? And so to make a long story short, within the next year, we had partnered with a, a pastor in the northern Thailand, started a foundation and bought property and built an orphanage. And immediately it was filled and I invited Daryl to come to be a part of the dedication of that. And we sang songs like we did this morning in four different languages simultaneously. It was absolutely incredible. And one of the songs the children sang first in, in the Aka language and then Thai and then English. And, but I remember the words uh, of, of part of the chorus. It says, and we'll never be lonely again. That's good deeds. Shortly after that, we built an orphanage in India, Chennai, India. For the children there that, whose parents died of AIDS, they didn't have AIDS, but they were stigmatized by it. And so they had a very rough um, road in their culture. So we built an orphanage for about 20 uh, uh, girls to be there at a time, for a time, until uh, they could be almost destigmatized. But there, during those two years, we told them about Jesus. I came, we came back from that, and... And in my, in my prayers, I just prayed, Lord, do you have anything hard for us? We had been starting campuses in, um, in the suburbs uh, around the Detroit, from Algonac to, uh, um, to Plymouth. And about that same time, one of our young men had a basketball outreach in Pontiac with some high-end basketball players, and they would gather together, and the whole league was about three or 400 with their families and he would share the gospel. And they lost the gym that they were using. So he, it was his, his ministry, we were just supporting him. But he came to me and he said, listen, I don't have a gym. I said, well, let's find a gym. 
And at the same time, I thought, why don't we just, we've been going 8,000 miles to help do good deeds in, in uh, Thailand. And eight miles away, in the city of Pontiac, people are desperately in need of Jesus with all kinds of human needs. And so we decided to start a campus in Pontiac and realizing that it would probably never be self-sufficient, but that was okay. We also wanted to start a dream center in conjunction with that campus, and a dream center is an entity that, that helps, and we thought it would really help us to keep urban ministry sustained because the needs were much greater than what you could accomplish on a Wednesday night and a Sunday morning in a, in a regular church. So we ascertained through surveys the top five needs of the community, and then we put that, that together to make that happen. Uh, God provided a building in a wonderful, in a wonderful way, and... Today, today, this morning, they're celebrating the 10th anniversary of that starting. And it's just continued to boom. Now there are several houses where men uh, uh, stay and are, have a place to stay. They're discipled. Uh, I've done devotions with them at 5 in the morning as they're learning some of the life skills and then uh, learn how to get a job and how to keep a job. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. But to do good deeds... Wouldn't it be wonderful if the city, your city, my city, when they had needs, we have homelessness, they would come to the church because they knew the church would be part of the answer to that. That's what has to happen. We're known for our good deeds and be intentional about it. Um, we must be on the offensive uh, with un unswerving support of the truth. The church is a pillar and ground of the truth. And so, and then to be unswerving with regards to genuine love. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you love one another. We have to, in, in, on one hand, be unswervingly in support of the truth without ever compromising it. But at the same time, show incredible radical compassion to a world that desperately needs to see Jesus. I shared this story last night of a, a friend of mine who pastors a church, and there was a man coming to his church who was transitioning to be a woman. It was kind of obvious. And so after the service one day, he was in the parking lot, and a lady from the church approached him. You can almost imagine what's going to happen. And she said to him, listen, if you need to know if you come to church here that we preach the Bible. And we preach that, you know, our pastor will preach that God created male and female and that we're created in his image. You need to know that. But she said, you need to know that if you come to church here, nobody's going to love you more than the people of this church. And then she said to him, and you need to get your makeup right. <laughs> and she helped him with his makeup. It wasn't long after that he came to know Jesus. And he said, well, that's a little risky. It is. He came to know Jesus and came to understand who he was in Christ. unswerving support of truth, and yet radical in compassion that we're known for our love for each other. The church cannot be divided. And finally, number five, the church must recognize its victory. And the gates of hell, verse 18 says, the gates of hell will not overcome it. We are overcomers. Um, I was doing a... a a pastor's conference in Armenia several years ago now. A hundred pastors are coming from Armenia, Georgia, Abhijajan, uh, Turkey, um, and Iran. There were two pastors that were going to come from Iran. I was really interested in meeting them. It was, the, the, the conference was in an old Soviet resort. It was really uh, up in the mountains in, in Armenia. Um, 
of the, of the 100 pastors there, 97 of them came through public transportation. Only three of them had their own vehicles. And by public transportation, it's like an extended van um, with capacity probably of 15 with 45 in there, something like that. Uh, every meal we had, they come, would come and put a plate in front of us. And when I travel, I just, uh, I'm very careful about what I eat, especially if I have to teach. So I'd pick away at it and maybe eat a little bit of rice. Every meal, somebody, one of those pastors would say to me, are you gonna finish that? And I said, no. Well, do you mind? And every meal, somebody would finish my meal. Um, I wanted to talk to the pastor from Iran. And so I, I basically said, tell me the story. There, weren't there supposed to be two of you coming from Iran? He said, the other, the other guy's in prison. Well, I said, tell me about that. He's he put in, in prisons in Iran and most of the Middle East are nothing like we have here. Unless family brings you food, you starve. Um, and he's in prison for being a Christian. His crime was he was caught with a Bible. Sentenced to six years in prison. That was a few years ago. Right now, Iran, there's such, the church in Iran is the fastest growing church in the world right now. You're not gonna read that or see that on the news. The fastest growing church in the world is Iran. I mean, it's all underground, mostly run by women, but this movement is, uh, it's growing, growing rapidly. If it continues at this pace, it'll be the first Christian country in the Middle East. Absolutely amazing. Where Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We will be victorious. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, once wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And while that's true, the blood of the martyrs has, 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 has caused a lot of growth in the church as the gospel has spread, as it did in Acts chapter eight, through the persecution in Jerusalem, they were scattered. But at times, the blood of the martyrs has almost wiped out the church in particular areas. But the church, Jesus' church, will ultimately prevail. Amen. We know that. We read that in Scripture. This is the promise of God. And you are a part of something that's victorious. Because you have the power of God, you have the presence of God, that he's assured you, Jesus has assured you, I will go with you always. We have a message, this is a message of hope that the world desperately needs to hear. Livingston County desperately needs to hear because everybody, people everywhere desperately need Jesus. So I'm so excited for you. Um, thank you for, for letting me preach here today. Um, and my encouragement to you, if you're not a part of the church, the church, having come to know Jesus by faith, may I encourage you to answer that question of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? And I pray that soon you'll come to the place where you say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that I was a sinner and needed a Savior, and Jesus, when he came, died on the cross, and he took my sins. That someday, sometime on that Friday on the cross, God placed on Jesus my sins and he died in my place, making it possible for the free gift of salvation that has to be received by faith. If you've not come to that place yet, uh, you're, maybe you're coming to this church, you got a lot of questions, this is a good place to come get questions answered. But I pray soon you'll come to know Jesus as Savior. If you don't know him yet, there'll be people around here with is it the orange tags, and we encourage you to talk to them, and they'd be happy to answer any questions. If you need reading materials, if you have questions, about uh, the resurrection or the authority of scripture, uh, they can get answers to those questions for you. Let me also challenge you. If you're not a part of a church yet, um, this is a really good one. I would encourage you to be a part of it, to join in in this journey of uh, what God is doing. This is a very special time. It's a very special place. And you have the opportunity of onboarding to what God is doing. Let me encourage you to do it. <clears throat> there was one guy in our church, he kept coming and kept coming. And he said, I'm never going to join. 
I said, well, why not? He said, because I've been hurt by a church before. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. If you, if you go to a restaurant and get bad food, you need to stop eating out? No. And I, I joke with him. I said, you need, to, you need to join the church so if you mess up, we can kick you out. <laughs> and he joined the church. Let me encourage you to be, become a part of this. And let me encourage you beyond that to share the good news of Jesus. Our world is a mess. Can I get a witness? It is a mess. And how many of you know that the problems aren't going to be solved by the colors red and blue? It's not going to happen. The answer to our world is Jesus. And the church is the mechanism to take the message of Jesus to the world. We do that individually, and we can make a huge impact corporately through Bible Baptists of Howell. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us your strength, give us your wisdom, give us your guidance. Father, I pray that you'll continue to bless this church with unity. I pray even for the days ahead as uh, the invitation is given for newcomers for a breakfast, as the invitation is given to, to get on board in terms of giving, that, Father, the response would be overwhelming. And, Lord, we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.